So this morning I wanted to, um, we're starting a series on generosity and what it means to be generous. Um, and I want to be a man of my word. So we're going to do, do a sermon on generosity and we're going to go into the whole realm of finances. But then I really felt the Lord shift me just in the last few days into worship. But, so I'm going to still teach on generosity. We're going to talk about generous worship. How many know that, it, that God is looking for generous worship? And sometimes we can worship God and we're not very generous in giving our whole self and we're just singing a song or, you know, but we're not really pressing in and giving from our hearts. And so I want to talk about what generous worship looks like, okay? Can we do that together? You know, one of my greatest prayers for this church is that we would reflect the heart of God for worship. You know, we need to grow in our passion for worship. And I want to start with this scripture in John chapter 4, verse 23. It says here, next slide. Okay. Pastor Sharon, can you go and hit the arrow up there? There's some, we're having problems with our projector today, so. Amen. We're just at technical difficulty. We'll get it. If you just shut it, bring it back up. You know what's exciting is we have, a, we have a church that loves to worship, amen? And we understand what worship is, but we want to continue to grow in that. We want to continue to grow in our passion, our desire, and our understanding of worship as we move forward. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Is it working? Hit the arrow key down. There you go. Awesome. All right, just stay there, Pastor Sharon, because my whole sermon's on slides, so I want to make sure it gets through, okay? Um, here's the scripture in John chapter 4, verse 23. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, this is very important because of the Bible saying, if Jesus is saying that, uh, that true worshipers are coming, then that means there's false worship. How many know if there's true, there has to be a counterfeit. There has to be a false. All right? And, and this is what was so important to the Father. It was so important to Jesus that we would become worshipers of his Father, to be worshipers. And so God is seeking true worshipers. It's very interesting because Jesus didn't say that he was, you know, the Father was seeking good public speakers. He wasn't looking for, you know, good, um, uh, good charismatic leaders or gifted administrators or you know, uh, someone who had like the best style or the, the best looking person. He wasn't looking for the person with the most Facebook friends, you know. God not, God's not looking for that. What God was looking for was people who could worship in spirit and in truth. That's so important to God. And so you know what worship is? Worship is a feeling or an expression, this is the next slide, um, of reverence and adoration for a deity. Okay, a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to show you some, some, um, some generous worship. How many would like to see some generous worship? I, ha I have some pictures. So we'll go to the next slide. Here's a picture of generous worship. This is true worship. Next slide, please. Okay. It's locked out again. I'm getting a new computer. Hey, well, this is not good. Okay, well, let's move on. Um, I want to show you some pictures. Okay. We'll wait. We're good. Yes. Go for it. Pray for the machine to work. Father, we pray that this machine starts working in Jesus' name. Amen. So. All right. There we go. Go back, 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 back. back. We got it going. Yes. Amen. Go back. Unless we got someone here who's a PowerPoint genius, get up in the sound booth, please. Because I think there's a setting or something, but go on. But here we got, um, this, is, this, is, this is generous worship. Now, this is a Justin Bieber con con uh, concert. Here's another one here, generous worship. Just totally engaged, totally emotional. This is generous worship. Next one. This is a U2 concert. Generous, hands lifted. Hallelujah, bono. You see? It's good. Next one. This is, in case you think it's just kids, these are some military guys at a kid rock concert. Yeah, we want your autograph, right? And so uh, there's some generous worship. 
Next slide. This is a soccer game. Hallelujah. You know, they're right into it. Generous worship. Amen. So how many know generous worship is really important to God? And you, the thing is, um, you know, um, sometimes you go to churches and people are afraid to just get emotional. And I, you go to some churches and the worship is going on and the songs are going on and people are standing like this. You might see a foot tapping if you look really closely. You hardly ever see a hand raised in some churches and it's just kind of like you just, everyone looks ahead and that. But you see that same person at a soccer game. They're like, yeah, they're a hockey game and they're just like undone. Why? Because where the heart, the heart worships what it's attracted to. And so what happens is, and I'm saying there's churches where people don't just emotionally let go and it's not, it's just they've been taught not to. They really want to. It's in their heart. As a believer, it's in our heart to worship God with our emotions. Give him our heart in worship and adoration. But we've been taught not to do that because it's, it's not proper. It's, God, is, God is holy and reverent, so you don't, you don't act like that. Well, that's foolishness. Worship, when we worship, we worship from our heart. We worship with passion. In Matthew chapter 15, uh, verse 8 to 9, it says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. And that's in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 and 9. Amen? And so this is what Jesus is speaking with. And we have to understand here that um, what worship truly is. And people say, well, the reason why we don't lift our hands, the reason why we don't shout, the reason why we don't, you know, uh, dance and all these things is because, you know, in the Bible, we don't have a pattern for worship in the New Testament. And I agree, we don't. Because there's a principle that whatever's been established in the old, pattern-wise, doesn't have to be reintroduced in the New Testament because it's already been established. And the early church understood what worship looked like because King David made it very clear in the Psalms how we are to worship how we are to praise God. So this was something that was already established. And so we have to understand that between the cross, sometimes there's a filter that filters out things from the Old Testament. And these things become what we call types and shadows of things that took place in the past. Other things go straight through the cross, right? Some things go straight through the cross. And uh, some of these things that go through the cross that I would, rec that I would say here, is, um, uh, is worship, uh, it's repentance, uh, it's tithing. Tithing passed right through the cross. It wasn't established with the law. It was established before the law. That's a whole other topic we'll get into later. But uh, things passed through the cross. So worship was already established in the Old Testament, and it passed right through the cross. And so the, the, the New Testament church knew how to worship. They understood that you could lift your hands, you could shake the timbrel, you could dance. That was all part of worship. Amen? And so David taught us how to worship. Do we have those scriptures up there? It says, shout with joy in the Lord all the earth. So we're supposed to shout with joy. That means why? Because we're excited, just like those rock concert pitcher, pitchers. You shout, you're excited, right? Sh worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing and with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us. And we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pastures. And so there has to be this shouting with joy. There has to be this worshiping the Lord with gladness. You know, when we come to church on Sunday, we shouldn't look like we drank lemon juice. We shouldn't be sitting there like, we should have smiles on our face. We should be lifting our hands. We should be shouting. We're to enter his, ca his gates with thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise, giving thanks to him and praise his holy name. And this is the way we're to come to God. Amen? And why in the world would we respond in such a way? Well, that if we keep reading, it tells us here, verse 5, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues once in a while for a few days. No, forever. His faithfulness continues to some generations. No, to each generation. God is faithful. He's good. He's perfect. And sometimes what happens is we begin to focus on the negative things that are going on in our life. And we're not remembering what God has done in our life. If you focus on the negative things in life, the enemy, he's got you. But if you start recognizing, listen, I'm going through trials, I'm going through tough times, but hey, you know what? I remember when God delivered me. You know what? God, you're going to deliver me again because you're a good God. And you begin to worship, begin to praise, and you begin to look at the glass half full, and God's pouring into it. Does that make sense? 
And so you begin to get happy. See, the church is supposed to be a happy place. It really is. People should come in here and just go, I don't know what's with these people, but they're happy. They've got something going on. Why? The Lord is good. But why, why are you so happy? Because God's good. Well, why, why are you lifting your hands and shut? Well, because His unfailing love continues forever. You know, why are you like, like crying and all emotional and everything? Uh, well, why do you do that at Justin Bieber concert? Or at, at, when you go see the Leaf game, you get emotional when your team loses, you know? I mean, come on, guys. This is God Almighty. But the church has said, listen, we gotta, we got to take... We've got to take this emotional thing. The devil says, you know, we've got to stomp it down. We don't want people to be passionate about God. Listen, David was passionate about God. So I'm going to be passionate about God. Amen? Because that was established in the old. It's passed straight through the cross, no filters. And the New Testament church understood worship in such this way. Okay? So let's move on. The Lord's good. His faithful love continues forever. His faithfulness continues to each generation. And, you know, um, since God is seeking true worshipers, we want to give God the worship, honor, and the glory that he's due. Generous worshipers, number one, worship with awe. They worship with awe. I want to be a generous worshiper. I don't, I don't want to. If God is sitting and watching us on Sunday morning, I don't want to be sitting there thinking about the roast in the oven. I want to give him my heart because he sees our hearts, right? This is a time, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life, I'm going to focus on the good things that God has done and I'm going to worship him. And you know what? When we worship him with awe, I love the way the writer of Hebrews says it. We'll go to the next slide in Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably. Now, I want to say this. If... The writer of Hebrews is telling us to worship God acceptably. That means we can worship him in an unacceptable manner. Amen? That's what happened with Cain and Abel. Abel offered an acceptable offering. Cain did, and, God, and God wasn't mean to Cain. He just came and said, hey, listen, if, if you do what your brother did, you'll be blessed too. And so I want to offer God an acceptable offering, which means I'm thankful in my worship. And so that's what worship is. It's coming to a place where you're thankful. God, I'm so thankful. I worship you. And you make a choice. Sometimes it's a choice. Why? Because God is a consuming fire. And, you know, I, I like this because um, he's not just my daddy. You know, we have this great revelation, and we have to know that God is our daddy. He's our father. We can come up onto his lap when we have issues, and he's going to help us. He cares about us. But at the same time, he's also almighty God. He's, he's a star-breathing God. I mean, he, he created the stars. He created the universe. He, you know, he, I mean, your eternity, everything lies in his hands. I mean, God is almighty God. There's nothing greater than him, and he's our daddy. So there has to be a reverence. There's, there's, a, there's a, an ability to just kind of relate to him because your dad, but he's also, he's also God almighty. And, and when you realize that he's a consuming fire and that nothing can stand in the way of God, there's a reverence and there's an awe of his majesty. And, and it's just like those teenagers that hang over, and, oh, Justin Bieber, you know? You're hanging over the balconies and you're saying, oh God, you're so mighty, because you have a revelation. Because you've set your mind and your affections upon him. Amen? I like Psalm chapter 95, verse six. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. Amen? Let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before. How, many, how often do we see people just kneeling? Do you ever kneel at home just before God and just worship? Say, God, you're worthy. You're so, you're, and I'm so undone in your presence that you would love a sinner like me. You could just, like, snub me out, but you love me unconditionally. Do you ever stop and just meditate on the goodness of God? Let us kneel before the God, our, our maker. You're doing a good job, by the way, Brian. Thank you. Let's give Brian a hand. Because okay. we've been having problems with that computer for the last little while, and we're going to replace it. So, um, The wise men bowed down to Jesus. Simon Peter fell to his knees. You think about the wise men who came to Jesus. They brought frankincense gold and myrrh. They, they brought the most precious thing to him. 
That's what you were talking about. When, when we give to God, let's give our best. Don't give him the leftovers. And so they, they brought frankincense, gold, and myrrh. I almost said Frankenstein. They brought all of these things to honor God. And as believers, we need to bring our best when we come. Bring our, our expression of love for him. Amen? Bible says one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. They're going to fall to the knees and say, Jesus, you're awesome. I never saw this. Let's do it now. Let's not wait to judgment day. There's a place of being overcome, being overwhelmed, being overflown with thanksgiving. Have, have you ever been in that place? You're just so overcome with God's goodness that you just can't help but praise him. You just can't help but sing. You can't just help but worship him. And that's the place that God wants us to live in. Amen? In that place of worship and adoration. Because he deserves it. Not because he needs it. It's because he deserves it. Amen? You know, the second thought concerning generous worshipers, they worship with awe. Number two, they worship with abandonment. They worship with abandon. You know, when the Ark of the Covenant finally arrived in the city of King David, David was... Um, leading the way with worship. And how did he do it? He did it with abandonment. And we see in the next verse here, it says, And David danced before the Lord with some of his might. He danced before the Lord with all his might. I mean, he was, I couldn't imagine what he looked like. He was just dancing, and they said he was wearing a loincloth, and he was like, yeah, just woo. And he was so passionate, engaged with God, because, because he was so happy that G God was showing up here the Ark of the Covenant was here. And look what it says here. David gave it all he had. He didn't care what anyone thought. He worshipped his God with all his might. And do you know what happened there? Out of all the people, the first to criticize him was his wife. His wife criticized him. and says, you know, you're humiliating yourself. People are laughing at you. You're going to be the laughing stock of the nation. You're supposed to be our king. What are you doing? And what does David say? David retorted to his wife. He says, I was dancing before the Lord. Yes, and I'm willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes, because God is worth it. Amen? And this was the heart of David. We call it Davidic worship, and it's passed through the cross. It's supposed to be part of the New Testament church. The devil has squelched it. He's put the fire out in many churches. And it breaks my heart, because I know there's people, good brothers and sisters in the Lord that are in churches, that on the inside, they're dancing, but they're standing again. I can lift my hand because I know the leadership doesn't like but God is God is moving in them to do it because it's part of our inheritance. Amen. So let it out. David said, You haven't seen anything yet, honey. You think I'm crazy now? Wait till I lose a loincloth. No, he didn't say that. I'm just sure. He didn't say that. Um, let's look at the biblical pattern. Just kind of give you an idea. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Psalm 150. Uh, verse 3 to 5. Did I put that scripture in the... You got it? Okay. Let's go one more. Okay, I'm just going to try to keep up. Okay, Psalm 150, verse 3 to 5 in the King James Version. David says, Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. In other words, worship is supposed to be loud. Praise is supposed to be loud. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Okay? Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments, the electric guitar and the bass and the flutes and the loud cymbals, hey? There you go. Scott, just go, go for it, man. Loud cymbals, man. God loves noise. Praise him with the clashing cymbal. And so, you know, worship is something that you give your all to and, and you enter into this thing. It's a, it's a time of celebration. Psalm 134, verse 2. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. This is all, all pre-cross. This is Old Testament worship. Say it passes through the cross. So if you go to a church that says, well, there's no New Testament pattern for worship, say it was already established in the Old and it's filtered, came right through the cross, and we're to worship in a way that pleases God. We want to bless him. We've got to lift our hands. Amen? And so don't go to a place where you're tolerated. Go to a place where you're celebrated. Amen. That's why you're here. Praise God. Psalm 47, verse 1. Praise to God, the ruler of earth. And it says here, I'm actually reading the, 
this was actually written to the chief musician. David wrote it to the chief musician, the main worship leader. He said, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Remember that song? Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Praise him, praise him. You remember that song? We used to do that. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of praise. Praise him, praise him, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You've got to throw your hands up, right? So, Because that's part of the praise thing, right? Um. Because of who God is, we can't help but give him praise. It's bubbling up on the inside of us. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants to push it down. And we've got to say, no, no, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise you. I'm going to focus on what is good. I know I'm going through tough times. I know there's tragedy in my life. But despite all that, you're still worthy. And you begin to focus on the good things you can focus on in regards to your relationship with God. You begin to praise him. You begin to worship him. And next thing you know, deliverance comes. Amen. You know, you know what it, what it is to experience his grace. You know what it is to be forgiven. You're different. You're his. Something has shifted in you. And focus on those good things and begin to worship him with all your heart. Amen? Um, how do true worshipers worship? There's a, the third thought I have here is worshipers worship with intimacy. Worship with intimacy. And this is so important because uh, David said in Psalm uh, 27, verse 4, uh, one thing I ask of the Lord this only do I seek. This is the only thing I'm seeking. This is David. Now, you remember, David's got the wealth. He's got the women. He's got every. I mean, he's got, he's got all the world can give him, and he's not even interested in that. He says, the thing I ask for, Lord, the only thing I seek is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Isn't that all there is? To see the beauty of the Lord. Do you know, I remember when, when I came to the Lord, came back to the Lord when I was 20, I would take up my guitar and I'd go in my basement and I would just worship for hours. And I had friends call me and say, hey, you want to go to the movies? You want to go hang out? Let's go do this or whatever. And I'd be like, I got an appointment with someone. Uh, I can't make it. And I, and I literally, this, and I would, I would go home from work and I would play my guitar and I would worship. And this was during the time of the renewal in Toronto. So the other, the nights I wasn't doing that, I was going to church. But I loved being in his presence. I would just talk to God and worship and sing and wait on his presence. And, you know, I was peculiar, like I'm supposed to be, right? Peculiar person, right? And I was doing it. I loved it. It was awesome. And then I met my wife when I went to Bible school, and we had a prophet come into the church. And he got up, and he had prophetic words for everybody. And I thought, yeah, God's going to have a good one for me, right? So I, he called me up, and he, he said, the Lord has said to me that you have substituted female companionship or my companionship for female companionship and I was like <gasps> because what had happened was when I met my wife she was so cute and so nice and I was so attracted to her and I liked hanging out with her that I started visiting her all the time and I stopped playing my guitar I stopped praying and all that stuff and this guy called it out and I was like oh and he said God is jealous for your affection and I was like okay Lord I'll, I'll, I'll leave her no I didn't say that um, but I had to balance some things out you know what I mean because all of my emotions and affections were for Camilla, and God wanted some of that. Because God is a jealous God. He, he wants some of your time. He really does. He yearns for you jealously, the Bible says. And so when you get together, God is more excited about your quiet time with him than you could ever be. When you get alone with God and start talking and worshiping, he's just like, yes, intimacy. Amen? And as you spend time in his presence, you begin to, you begin to know God. In, in a different way. It's not that you just know about him, but you know him. You know, I know sometimes people go to Bible college and, and they, they start studying in the seminary. I mean, seminary? Cemetery? Did I say? I get them all mixed up. And, and, and they, they come out and they're like, they have all this knowledge, but they have no passion for God anymore because they, it, all, it all became about the intellect and not about the heart. I know when I, with my wife, I know just from being around her, if she looks at me a certain way, I know exactly what she's thinking. It's like telepathy. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, I know I said too much, or I shouldn't have said this, or should I, you know, or, you know, or, oh, she really, you know, tonight's going to be a good night. You know, I can tell by the, I can tell by the way she looks at me, right? I just kind of know her heart. You know what I'm saying? And the funny thing is I don't have to go to Google and say, what does it mean when Camilla looks at me this way? 
I don't have to get out and cycle, cycle, and I don't have to study and research. What does my wife want? I, I know, because we're intimate. Does that make sense? And so you no longer have to go to Google and say, what does God think about, you know, this type of life? So you don't have to Google what God thinks anymore because you know it in your heart because you spend time with him. Amen? You know what God's calling you to do. You know the areas in your life that you need to, to make a decision to, to straighten out and get out of this lifestyle or get out of that or do this. Or do. You just know in your heart of hearts. You don't have to Google it. You know because you're in relationship. You're a worshiper. Amen? You need not any man teach you, for you have an anointing that teaches you all things. You just need to learn to listen. Amen. <laughs> you know, God wants us to know us intimately. The only way to do that is born out of time in his word. It's born out of time in his presence. Out of hours in his presence, you begin to know God. You know, my desire for ATC Church is that we will just have a culture of worship that's one of our that's one of our core values and we do have that culture it's amazing we, ju we just want it to increase amen i love to look out here and see every hand lifted and every heart you know worshiping and and don't get me wrong i'm not saying people at other churches that don't lift their hands and don't dance aren't worshipers i'm not saying that i'm just saying let it out you know don't put a bottle cap on what god wants you to express to be amen i believe we could be a church that's transformed by his grace we can lift our hands and worship and surrender. That's what God wants us to do. You know, how do we worship? We worship with awe, we worship with abandon, and we worship with intimacy. And that's what God's calling us. To be generous, we have to do those three things. Here's another verse here. Accept my prayer as incense offered to you, and my upraised hands as an evening offering, is what David says. Amen? And even when things are rough we need to learn to praise him and worship him but you know my wife and she'll probably tell this story one day when she's preaching but when she was in bible school she joined well she was part of a worship team and we had a drill sergeant for a worship leader but he was a really good leader demon he was part of the red army from russia and he came and he was like this is how you worship the lord but he was very passionate he'd really get into it right and so one day he was leading and he said okay hey, we're going to dance before the lord right is that what it was we're going to dance and camilla's like I don't feel like dancing. He goes, you're going to dance, girl. And he pulled out his, no, no. He said, no, we're going to dance. He says, sometimes, he says, you, it, the Bible says we need to give a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice means it's going to cost you something. You don't feel like doing it, but you're going to do it because God asks of, of you. And so Camilla, she said, okay, well, fine. I'll, I'm going to offer a sacrifice of praise. And she began to dance. And, and she said she felt the presence of God come over her and her eyes began to, she just really felt the presence of God. And she says now every time she makes a choice to dance, depending on how she feels, not depending on how she feels, the presence of God begins to come. Because when we offer a sacrifice, it transforms. Amen? I want to end with this one story out of the Bible in Acts chapter 16, verse 22 to 29. Are we doing okay even with all our problems there? Everybody's flowing with me? Good. Okay. I want to talk about Paul and Silas. The multitude rose up against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. How many know these guys weren't having a good day? That's a bad day. I don't know about you. I haven't had my back beaten with rods. But when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing to God. Singing hymns. We've got to do more hymns here, right? Singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prisons were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened, say all the doors, and everyone's chains were loosed. See, here's the thing. You've got to realize something. They, they were singing and praying, and, and as they were doing it, everyone was listening. You know, when we're, when we're doing church, we have new people coming in that don't know God, and they're sitting here. They might not be worshiped. They're just listening. They're just kind of checking these guys out. But what happens when you sing? God's power shows up. And so, so look what happens. Everyone was listening. 
And, and not only was Paul and Sire, uh, Silas, not only was their door open and their chains came off, but everyone who was listening got in on the benefit of their worship. And I'm saying here, if we want a revival church, when we learn to worship and we make a sacrifice of praise and we're going to press in, not only are our chains broken, not only, not only are our doors open, but all those who are listening, all of a sudden, boom, the shackles open, the doors open, so the Holy Ghost can get a hold of their heart and then get saved. Amen? It creates an atmosphere for the supernatural. And the keeper of the prison awoke from his sleep, seeing the prison doors were open, supposing the prisoners had left, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. And Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, we are all here. Now this is really cool because, you know, uh, this just shows you like he was hardcore, Paul, right? God's like, I'm gonna set you free. Everything, everything, all the shackles open. The doors open, Paul just stands and goes, I'm not leaving. I've got work to do. Like, you, I don't know if you see this, but, and he tells, hey, guys, don't leave the prison. God's going to do something great out of this. And then look what happens here. I just think this is really cool, because I don't know about you, but my shackles open, I'm, I'm heading for the door. But Paul stood there. I'd want to get out of there. And so the keeper of the prison, awakened from his sleep, seeing the prison's doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, do yourself no harm, we are all here. And then he called for a, uh, a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Worship opens people's prisons. Shackles are open, people get saved, and God moves. We, we went and did a funeral uh, the other day for a young man. Some of you maybe met Tyler. He, was, he got saved at this altar probably seven or eight years ago. And we went to his funeral, and his father and, uh, is a Christian and uh, had his guitar. And a lot of the family members there, they're just not God people. They're just, just not there. But they're there, and he got it, and he started singing some old hymns. And literally, we could feel the atmosphere just <laughs> it completely change. And he, he, he wasn't even aware of what happened, but he prepared the atmosphere. When I got up and shared the word, people began to respond their hearts were softened towards God. Wasn't it wonderful? And that's what worship does. Worship opens people's prisons. Shackles are open. People get saved. Amen? So what I want to do right now, I'd like to take a nap this afternoon, but I can't. I have to go to Toronto with my wife. But what, but what I'd like to do is I'd just like to pray for, pray for us, uh, just all of us. And then we're going to end with the song that we did, one of the songs we did. Um, so if I can have the worship team come up. I just want you guys to give your hearts and just worship God. Maybe maybe take a step. Maybe maybe you're a person who doesn't normally worship. Well, today's you can take a step. You can tap your foot. Or you can lift one hand if you've never lifted your hands. And just begin to enter into a new level, whatever that is for you. And if any of you need prayer for anything, you know, during the song, if you want to come up, I know some of our prayer team will see you come up and they'll come up and pray with you and we'll just let God be God and uh, it'll be good. So Father, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, here, God, that we would become uh, passionate worshipers, God. We go to the next level in worship. We take the lid off. That we will worship with awe, with worship, uh, with abandon, we'll worship with intimacy, God, because we want to be generous worshipers in your kingdom. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen.